Because every bar normally has about six or seven of them. But if you kind of notice as you're going around what actually is an IPA nowadays, it's a lot of debate. When's the last time you guys saw a West Coast IPA on tap? <laughs> Amsterdam. Okay. I think Black Lab has one, but right now the style has gone completely muddled, right? Within three years, there now is New England IPA, IPA, Hazy IPA, and everything else that just has more hops in it, okay? There's no standard what you would call an IPA. So when I'm going to go through a couple recipes and how to make them, the idea is for you to just make an IPA that you want, okay? We're not going to go guidelines, we're not going to go uh, very particular, right? Because the idea is you're going to make one that you like, not one that's going to just fit in a category because the category is changing every other week. Okay? The amount of hops that used to go into an IPA like six, seven years ago, you put that in now, you just made a session pale ale. <laughs> okay? The hop wars are here. I didn't start them. I contributed, but I didn't start them. Okay? <laughs> But the, uh, the homebrew shops do appreciate the extra business. <laughs> okay. Uh, this is going to time out every few seconds. So basically, when I'm looking to make a recipe, what I try and do is I'll take attributes that I like from all different beers that I've tried, okay? Very rarely do you find a beer and you're like, oh my god, this is the best thing ever. I just want to clone the shit out of this and not drink another thing in the rest of my life. Okay? Sometimes you like the aroma of one beer, you like the mouthfeel of another beer, and so on and so on. Because you have your own unique taste, and nobody just made a beer for you, sorry, but they didn't. It's your job, if you're going to make a beer, to take all the different things that you like and make it into one. Okay? So you're going to have to play around with different hops, different malts and that to get the different tastes that you want out of your IPA, and then hopefully out of the end you've made one that you like. Whether a judge agrees with you or not, who knows? Judges are finicky, scores are all over the place, don't stress out, just drink your four and a half gallons of beer and enjoy life. Okay? <laughs> so a caveat when you are changing your recipes, try and just change one or two things at most. If you start changing everything, who the heck knows what happened, right? Pretty simple. I'm just going over a few things quickly and then we're just going to go through recipes. Do most people use beer smith? Yes. No. You guys just write everything down? Okay. You guys are really good at math then, huh? Brewfather. Brewfather. Do you guys use software that calculates IBUs? No. All right. You're off to a stellar start. <laughs> so beer smith 2 uh, was great until Beersmith 3 came out and you realized how many IBUs you were picking up during steeping and whirl whirlpooling. And then you have a mini heart attack and you do things differently. Okay? IBUs are completely nonsense, but they're good to kind of have an idea, right? You can't like, some IPAs will say like 400 IBUs. You're like, great, it's a <laughs> nuclear hops attack or something like that. I don't know. But you need to understand that um, IPAs are very finicky style. Like everybody always goes lager, there's no place to hide. IPAs is very similar, right? If you get any oxygen pickup, you just made uh, swamp water within like a couple of weeks. It's gonna go brown, it's not gonna be what you did. You spent $80 in hops and it's gone sideways, right? If you, um, uh, the water will dictate everything. The when you put hops in, certain hops like Vic Secret, does anybody use those hops? Okay, if you use them in the boil, ugh. If you use them in the whirlpool later on or dry hopping, good. So you gotta really know when you're gonna use these hops, but to do that, you gotta start playing around with them, okay? Um, the other thing is the temperatures, and that, has anybody got Scott Janish's new book? That's his name, right? Scott Janish, yeah. Yeah, it's a really good book. Okay, you can read the whole thing, lots of different ways to go about it, really will make you rethink everything, right? But it's pretty complicated uh, style of beer. Okay, so sometimes when you make an IPA, what you try to make and what you end up making are two different things. You guys ever made a beer and you're like, what the heck did I just actually make? 
<laughs> Wife? Yeah. Yeah. Sometimes I'm like, I don't know, so I'm going to send it to a competition and somebody who knows more than me is going to tell me what I made. And sometimes I'm right, sometimes I'm wrong. Uh, the issue is, is because if you enter American IPA, what it used to be by guidelines and what you see now commercially are like two different things. And then there's New England IPA and what that is. Where I end up making beers, I call them Middle America beers. So they just end up in the middle. So it's really up to you what you're going to end up with. All right, let's just start playing with some recipes. If you guys have questions, can you just ask them? Like, I don't want like a formal presentation and just going through and talking to myself and everything. Any questions so far about anything? No? OK. So this is beer smith for those who don't have it. Uh, there's different ways you can just put in where you're going to put your hops in. So Double Sunshine is. Uh, anybody have Lawson's Finest Sip of Sunshine? Anybody been to Vermont? Yeah? This is the recipe. Uh, I was lucky enough to actually brew it with the guy during a um, conference. So this is what New England IPAs used to be a couple of years ago. And if you brewed them now, they've completely changed. And it'll change again. But what you can start doing is, okay, well, let's take an example. What, who here is making an IPA set? <laughs> Anybody see the movie Sandlot? <laughs> you're killing me, Smalls. You're killing me. Okay, you're making an IPA. What are you going to make? Okay, so double IPA, imperial IPA. West Coast or East Coast? Or center? East Coast. East Coast. Okay. How are you gonna get to get that style? Okay. Why sugar? <laughs> okay. So if we just start asking questions about ingredients. We can kind of figure out because what sugar is gonna do? It actually dries out a beer. And if you're doing a New England IPA, you want it to hover around 118.20 kind of way, right? Because you got to get that mouthfeel. If you start using other ways to dry it out, just make sure you keep it down, like 5% or less kind of thing. Otherwise, you're going to lose your juiciness. So for juicy, how do, how do people get juiciness out of this? I love this word. Too, calcium right? chloride. Calcium chloride, okay. Does everybody know what calcium chloride is? <laughs> Why am I here? <laughs> <laughs> All right, so if you want to get your New England IPAs a certain way, you need to alter the water. You can't just use the water that we're using here, or you won't get what they want. So, uh, which one? All right, so this is what the water kind of chemistry looks like when you're doing a New England IPA. So this is the one I did and it went um, at junction, okay? So if you notice down here, these are your mineral levels. See this? Very high, okay? We're getting close to the unsafe range. I've heard some people can go up to as high as 400. I don't know, but you can, okay? <laughs> So if you're going to do a New England IPA, these chlorides have to go high. The problem is your sulfates. So normally people go to a 2 to 1 ratio. Does everybody know what 2 to 1 ratio is? <laughs> All right. Your sulfates will give you your hop aroma. So if you ever get like a really hoppy New England IPA and you notice that it's kind of muted, it's because the sulfates are low, the, chlori uh, sorry, uh, the chlorides are super high. All right? But you need to do that. So the way to get your hop aroma really high is to uh, bombard it with hops, which is great. <laughs> so if you're going to go for that style, that's the way you want to do it. So if we just take uh, this recipe. So we've got chit malt. So that just gives it a little smoothness. Chit malt is... I think they're carrying it. Are people? Oakma has it. I don't think. I don't know if anyone has it though. I think Toronto Brewing might have had it in for a while. So it's what everyone was using on the East Coast. So Hetty Topper and all those different ones. 
Okay, then you go with your Citra. This one, pretty good amount of hops. So there's about three ounces per gallon. So your kit probably tells you to do like 0.75, right? If you go by a lot of the recipes, it's just not enough hops, right? Everybody jokes because they always say more hops, but honestly, like to get the aroma and the efficiency, we can't get it on the homebrew scale. They can get it more in a brewery, but otherwise you've got to go higher than you think. It's very difficult to wrap your head around. Is this 10 ounces for 12 gallons? 10 ounces? No, no, it's 36.5 oh, ounces. Wow. <laughs> it's way higher. Yeah. It's for double IPA. Yeah. Double IPA, you're going to even do more hops, right? And then it's where you use them. Now, if you're doing the New England IPAs, you normally keep them out of the boil because it gives you the bitterness, so you use a lot of your whirlpool and your dry hoppy, right? But what I've seen is a lot of those beers turn out pretty one-dimensional. It's best to, I would do like a small charge at like five minutes left in a boil, just to try and give it some sort of layering when you're going through the hops. Okay? For, for those of us who don't have a uh, way to cool our beer, yeah. what would you recommend for dry hopping or for whirlpool? Uh, oh, sorry, are you gonna use an infusion? You cool it down to pitching rates somehow, right? Like over time with temperature. <laughs> yeah. So if you're doing like an ice bath or something, just have it sit there, have your thermometer, sanitize it, and then you can wait, right? Until what? Like 70 or something? They say like 180. Which translates to in Celsius. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> God knows. Uh, you can do it that way. The theory is that if it gets cooler, the hops will, uh, the aroma will be preserved more and there will be less bitterness, right? Uh, I haven't noticed a huge difference and it takes forever to cool something down to that temperature and then have it sit. It's also one of those, like, if you really end up thinking it's worth it or not. So uh, you're saying that's, that's what they're saying, right? Because if you put it in... As soon as you kill it, you're still at like near boiling temperature, so the bitterness is going to get absorbed more, right? The lower the temperature you go, the less it happens. That's why when you're dry hopping, you don't get the, the bitterness per se. There is still bitterness and a thing called hop creep. So if you are using a lot of uh, dry hopping, you will still get IBUs off of that. So you got to just make sure that you, you account for it. Uh, and then you also get hop creep and hop bite. You guys ever had those beers where it's like you're chewing on a, a hop? The easiest way to do that is just uh, wait two weeks after you've kegged it. It'll go away. Uh, Mike? Yeah. Uh, so, let's get back to the real cool stuff. ADCs, which is 180. Yep. Uh, how long do you let it stand? I normally do. 10 to 15 minute whirlpools. And then I'll kill it and see if they go down. Normally it doesn't. Like when you brewed with me a couple weeks ago and we just end up clogging the chiller. Somebody jinxed me, okay? It's never happened before. I'm not naming names, but it was him. <laughs> uh, that, that's their best bet. Because the idea is uh, hops are expensive. You need a lot. So you need to find every way to get the best bang of your buck. Right, so that's knowing where you're going to put them in during your brew day and how to best preserve the hop aroma. Pretty much. Is there a way you go about making your like hop mixtures and say like a blend or something like that? Do you like do a certain portion of like say fruity, a certain portion of pine, sort of like is it an experimental thing or something you approach like beforehand or? So a, a lot of, I've made a lot of IPAs. So. A lot of it is trial and error. I've mashed everywhere from 149 to 160. Don't do 160. Don't do it. Bad idea. But with hops, what I did is I got about five different guys, and we just went and we each we bought like maybe 20 different varieties. We took a board and we just kind of crisscross and put them in, and then we just started getting them and just doing little grind to go, okay, yeah, this works, and we would write down combinations that we could try later on that would work. Like if you're a big brewery buying them from the IMG or something, you're like the hop rub sort of thing. Yeah, like, I know there's hop teas, that's never worked for me. Uh, the hop rub's just kind of easy. You just get an ounce and 
if you like try a beer after and be like, you know what, it needs a little more pine, maybe next time we'll switch up the ratio yeah. a little bit? Or? Yeah, once, once you decide the combinations you want to try, start Googling. Maybe somebody's tried it, you can kind of learn from their mistakes or things that have worked for it. Uh, because what happens is there's different ratios. So has anybody used Mosaic? Yeah, it dominates, right? So if you have a more mild hop, you can't do equal that with Mosaic or you're just gonna have Mosaic. So you're gonna have to, you're gonna have to brew a beer a few times. I know as home brewers, we like to brew a different beer like every other day. Uh, but when it comes down, if you're trying to make an IPA that you really like, those are the things that are gonna change. Um, you'll go up a little bit, down a little bit, and then you'll finally find what works best with even that combination. Right? Just try and pick hops that you're gonna be able to have access to. If you do like, what is this, Saboro now? Saboro? Saboro. I can't pronounce anything. Uh, they might be hard to get later on, and then you come up with something, and now you got to sub something else in right away. But that's a good question. I mean, just get a few of you together and, and try it out, and then you can work from there, right? All right. Yeah. So when you dry hop, normally you wait until a certain amount of fermentation is gone, and then you go for it, or you doing steps because you don't want it too too much too long being there, right? Yeah. So. It, it really depends what you're trying to make. So if you're trying to make a West Coast IPA, you normally don't do your dry hop until after it's completed fermentation. Then you'll do a dry hop for a few days and cold crash, right? The problem with that is oxygen, so you gotta be very careful. The New England IPA is even worse for oxygen. If it even gets a sniff of it, it's, it's ridiculous. Like they've even worked it out that if you bottle your um, New England IPAs that a certain amount of oxygen can actually get under the bottle cap and then sewer you. So it's just awesome. So just whenever you make that, invite people over and drink that real quick. Okay? But they normally do two-step dry hop for that. So one you'll do at the beginning. And what I normally do for that is I'll make that a bit smaller than the end one because the fermentation will blow off some of the aroma. Uh, so what you'll do is your bigger charge will be, what I like to do is about three points before the end. And the way you know your end is you gotta know which yeast you're using, right? So I tend to tick, uh, stick with the um, London uh, 1318, and I know that it'll always go to 118, so when it hits like 121, 122, that's when I'll do my dry hop, and then it'll take up the oxygen from there. Uh, if we even go further on that, so you can do it that way through, you can also do keg dry hopping. Right? But every time you move a New England IPA, you're opening yourself up for oxygen. And it's really hard to keep oxygen completely out. Like You can fill it up with water and sanitizer, push it out, purge it and everything else, you still end up with oxygen. If you really want to get it, you got to take your, uh, your gas and cut it so it's just at the brim, fill it completely up, then empty it, make sure your dip tube's completely down so there's no foam, because that has oxygen in it too. And that's for the first time. If you're gonna dry hop it and then hop it to a second time, you can see how much more difficult it gets. Plus there's oxygen stuck within the hops and you go cross that, right? So try to minimize like moving the beer around too much when you're dry hopping. So I just do it in the carboy three or four points left, and then I call it a day. Do you recommend doing like these big dry hops? Do you recommend putting them in like a muslin bag or something, or just putting no. them in? No. No, it, I find that it just compacts, and it's like uh, the inside hops don't get any exposure. So I just put it loose. And, and cold trash after, and then? So I'll put it loose. I'll normally dry hop for two, three days. Yeah. And then every time I walk by the beer, I just give it a little, yeah. a little shake, just to try and keep them suspended. And then everything, you know, just to, maybe I'm OCD. I don't. And know. you're racking from the top, obviously, right? When you're yeah, it. yeah. So as you can see, there's, there's a lot of different ways. Have you ever thought of putting a bunch of dry hops in small and like breaking it up, break up your nine ounces into three ounce bags? Yeah. All at once, so there's more contact happening. <coughs> yeah. So they. they 
that was, that's another way to do it because the idea is you can utilize the most bit by bit by bit uh, for the density, but then again, it's every time you open that thing up and you put new hops I'm in. Saying all at once, so you have three separate bags you put in at the same time, which is instead of nine ounces in one big bag, three yeah. ounces, three ounces, three ounces all at once. That would definitely be better. Yeah. It would definitely be better than the one, but what you can do is. Um, just put a filter when you're racking them, and then you shouldn't have a problem anyways. And then you can go on OBJ, the website, and you just get like the end dip tube filters and just put those on your kegs. And then that should filter it so you don't get clogged when you're actually pouring it on your system too. Uh, there's gonna be hot particles around. It's not a clear beer style. So it's good, unless you're chewing it, then it's bad. <laughs> What's, a, what's the maximum number of different hops you combine into? And I and think I'm still tasting good. <laughs> like the amount or the different types? Different types. I've done like six or seven, but like at that point, it's really like. Yeah. Um. So some of these you can use lactose. Does everybody know what lactose does? Don't use too much of it. Uh, the, you'll end up with a milkshake IPA and they kind of taste gross if you're going for something else. So keep it low. And then oats. Oats is a big thing. So it used to be that you use 20% oats and make it hazy. And then they found out that actually if you use any more than 10%, it actually does a reverse and somehow clears it. I have no idea. That's science for you. I didn't pay attention in class. <laughs> but don't do it. How about wheat? Wheat? You could, yeah. I mean, un, like, un, like raw wheat. Yeah, it's anything to get the mouthfeel, right? There were some breweries down in the U.S. that were accused of using flour. I wouldn't go that route. And that was actually the, one of the top breweries in the U.S. Trillium, who's like super well known for it. So maybe it works, maybe it doesn't, but. Yeah, no, it's, it's easier because then, like, I can give a presentation on useless information. If you guys actually have questions, then it can, like, actually work out. How, how did you say you cleaned up your dry hops? Did you get right tank? No, so I just have, um, well, I have conicals if I'm doing bigger, bigger ones, and you just, you try and just cold crash it and get them out and then rack from the top. If I'm using a carboy, I created my own little weird thing. And it's uh, just like a filter on the bottom, so when it sucks it up, you don't get it. So that's that's your best bet. Um, I guess this would be a good time to say if uh, the way you transfer, you got to make sure that you're not getting any oxygen, right? So uh, if you're using one of those primer pump things, that's that's a good way to ruin your IPA really quick. So you got to come up with some way to do a counter pressure if you really want to do it well. Uh, if you guys, you can send me a message uh, and I can show you exactly what I use. And I think it costs something like $10 to make. And it's just CO2 goes in and counter pushes it up and then goes straight into the keg and it's all purged. So it's pretty, it's pretty easy to do. Uh, I mean, if I could do it, that uh, pretty much guarantees all of you can do it. <laughs> Back to your hops and dry hopping. How do, you, how do you put your actual hops in without mixing oxygen? I just, I just throw them in. You dump them in, but doesn't that introduce that? That's why I make sure I got the few points uh, oh, okay, so left, right? Because I'm really counting. Yeah, I'm really counting on my um, uh, my yeast to clean it up, right? There's some really cool ideas online of people that have like these. CO2 purge chargers on top of fermenters yeah, and everything. Yeah, I mean, like some people are crazy. Has anybody seen low oxygen brewing? Have you seen yeah. this guy? It looks like a spaceship. <laughs> <laughs> like, I have no idea. Like, this guy spent like a half million dollars, I think, on his homebrew set. It's incredible. Like, you can come up with all these things, but it's like, how do we get it so the common brewer can actually use them to do, do IPAs well, right? So I'm not saying that you might not be able to get no oxygen, but it's like how many steps can you do to at least reduce it, right? It might give you an extra two, three weeks at the end of your IPA, because that's this basic. If you don't drink it within two months, it's it's not gonna end up tasting really well, right? So if you notice like 
beers have bell curves of when they taste good. So even an IPA that's really hot, it really, at the beginning, it's like, oh my God, this is like hot bite. No, 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 no. <laughs> then it hits the top and you're good. And then it starts going sideways and you have like the aroma dropped off and everything else. So just when you're setting in on your recipe, just try and find out what the beer does. Keep tasting it at different times. Are you dry hop should... Uh put your hops into another container and rack onto your hops or you might go Yeah, that's always fun. Container. Yeah, my so wife loves when that just happens. Just get another carboy. You want to dry hop between another carboy or a keg, put your hops in, rack on top of it because it'll, it'll just geyser them. Yeah. Another way you can do is you can actually dry hop in a keg in your serving keg. So a lot of times I'll put uh, cryo hops in my serving keg so it keeps it fresh the whole time. So I'll maybe do like 0.25 of an ounce of two different types, normally like a mosaic and citra, and just put it in the bottom and then rack the beer completely on top of that. And then you kind of keep that fresh hop taste for every pour. My idea of a perfect IPA is when you start pouring it and you can smell it when you're standing there, right? And the cryo hops are good because there's not too much density in it. It's good bang for your buck. I don't really like the cryo hops in the actual brewing process. Just haven't had really good results with them. But in the keg, it's not bad. Do you keep it low? Um, so this is a brew slam winner one, apparently. Um, just a different way of doing it. Just showing you just different uh, malt combinations you can use and the percentages. Uh, this one actually uses crystal malt. A lot of people say don't use it in IPAs. I actually like it in even like New England style IPAs. If you keep it low, again, the problem with crystal malt is it gives you oxygen. Everything gives you oxygen, apparently. Uh, again, this one's hopped really, really high. The, have you guys been entering IPAs in competitions? No? Yeah. I, I actually got the I got a silver on that one. Yeah? <laughs> okay, so everyone take a picture. Apparently this one works. Uh, the the problem is is if you're gonna try and brew to win a medal, you may not actually like your own beer. And the reason why I say it is because what happens is you end up going up against other really hoppy beers and yours kind of gets muted if you don't over hop it. But like when I'm actually at home having a beer, I don't like it as hopped. I like it more well balanced, but in a competition it tends not to do so well because the judges will get palate fatigue and everything else. I've had uh, where you put in like two and a half ounces per gallon and the, the judges literally write more hops. I'm like, okay. <laughs> and then you end up getting to four ounces and they give you a gold, which is overkill if you're actually gonna do normal. So hold on a second, that means that if your beer was judged first. <laughs> yeah, I screwed all of you if mine was judged first. <laughs> right. No, that's, that's what it sounds like. It sounds like it depends on where you place yourself. Yeah. Flight, yeah. Right? Like if you're entering IPAs, don't don't get down if you don't medal. Uh, the category is just stacked. It, it it has like 50, 60 entries in it. Uh, the if you end up with some guy who has a hot bomb and even it wasn't a good one, it can do palate fatigue, and the aroma dissipates really quick. So what they're doing in U.S. competitions now is they're having people actually send three bottles, not two, for IPAs specifically. So if you do win. If you do go to a mini vessel show, you'll have a new fresh bottle for the mini vessel show, and then another one for the vessel show to three, because the aroma just drops off these things that quick. All right, so. I know you use a lot of different fruits in your IPAs. What were some of your favorites? Uh, for fruits? Okay, so yeah, that one was 4.3 ounces per gallon. <laughs> I love it. Yeah. Yeah. Well, that's why we have a bulk buy, gentlemen. <laughs> um, 
that's why like there's only certain ones I'll only brew them for competitions to tell you the truth I, I won't brew them for other purposes but that's a problem that if, if your goal is to win a medal or your goal is to make a beer that you really enjoy that's why I don't really make any IPAs for competitions anymore I'm doing lagers Czech dark lagers and different beers that I can actually enjoy a lot more because when you do enter the IPAs you're entering the hop race right uh, when it comes to uh, fruit, the best I've liked is passion fruit and mango and guava. Uh, pineapple's weird, it actually clears the beer out again. I don't know. Why. What? It, it clears the beer. There's something in it that starts with a P and it does this weird. Yeah, yeah. It's, it's a finicky uh, fruit. It's pasteurized. Yeah. 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 Don't share your secrets. No, but like that's that's something I didn't know, and and it's when you actually do one like that, it it, it you need to know your fruit. The one that I like the best is mango. That's probably why most breweries do it. Uh, the way I was doing it is I would do like 15 gallons of IPA. One would stay normal. One would go one type of fruit, and one would go another. And then you use about one one gallon. Or one pound of puree per gallon of beer. In the fermenter, not the keg? I would do it in the keg and then hop it again because you get a secondary fermentation and it eats up your oxygen. In the fermenter, you mean to In the keg, so. One pound per gallon, one pound per gallon? Of mango? You mean one pound per five gallon? No, I mean one pound per gallon. Fruit starts at one pound per gallon. I, I hate to be the bearer of bad news, but that's that's what it is. Like if you make a one pound, five gallon IPA mango, people will go, is it is this is mango in here? It, it won't, right? Because you got the hops and it's got to overshadow that. And even when it comes to the fruit ones, I'll hop it less. Like I'll split them and I won't dry hop that as much, just so I don't have to up the mango. But yeah, you need it. And mango is actually a good one. Guava, you need even more. Uh, it's yeah, I'm, I'm sorry that the kits lied to so, you. So is your mango blueberry? Blueberries worse. Strawberries, I think, like five pounds. Do you? Um, yeah. you uh, where do you find? Can I just stick to one for any reasonable price to go to a beer? Let me know. Because <laughs> uh, they're like this big, right? And you're like five no, no, I, I, you can go online and you can get um, a puree sent to you. And then if you go to like really good natural grocery stores, they have some natural juices. You can get a juice at some Yeah, just make sure there's no sugar content in them. Have you ever tried uh, durian like <laughs> Should I? Or is it <laughs> if you want to live in the house where you're spending it. Yeah. I've always wanted to do that. Well, I was just asking, uh, do you uh, do you say stick with one type of fruit in the right season? Do you ever blend like yeah, I've done papaya and mango together. Uh, papaya is great if you can find it on sale. Uh, it comes on sale like a couple times a year. It tastes pretty funky though, but you that much fresh. Okay, uh, so just going over a couple different yeast things. So there was one thing that was floating around of using dry yeast, and it was apparently Treehouse's clone. Julius. Yeah, Treehouse is crazy. Uh, they won't even let their own brewers know the water chemistry. The owner actually goes around and puts it in. Uh, so there's something going on with the water there and, and that. But this is supposedly what their yeast was. So three different dry yeasts. Yeah, I tried it, it, it was horrible. It was really bad. It's disgusting. Huh? Propagate uh, it. Yeah, you could try if you could ever get a can of it. I mean, you can go to the brewery and wait in a six hour lineup. Uh, yeah. So, uh, quickly to cover yeast, uh, there's lots of different types. Most of them are the same, they just have different names. Uh, the one I found that worked best is 1318. Uh, Imperial Juice is also really good. The A24 is really good. Uh, Scarpments, London, London Fog. Foggy London. There's London and there's Fog and it's some combination. 
Uh, those ones are great. Just try and find like a house yeast that you like, so then you can kind of work with it. Again, if you're going New England IPA, you want one that's going to settle around 18 to 20, 22. If you're going West Coast, you're down around 8 to 12-ish kind of thing. So actually, we had, we had a blind tasting with all the uh, IPAs. They brought in the uh, Julius. Yep. And apparently, left fields eat out the uh, Julius. Yeah, I mean, there's huge hype around Treehouse, and a lot of hype influences things. So, I mean... Okay. They, they've done that before and Budweiser is like scored really high we all poop on it and then it's like you do a blind tasting and you're like I feel shame because now I really lost it yeah yeah and it depends on that so so here here you go look 14 gallons and it's only 25 ounces see I'm a man of moderation yeah, so this is a West Coast. Again, it's different ways of how you want to hop it, different combinations. If you guys want, I can, you can send me any questions you have about recipes and going over them. Again, it's, it's so hard to give like a general kind of thing. It's just having you look at different hops, different ways, different malts you can do and combinations. And then you can just send me a message and we can kind of go over what exactly you want to do. Are you down for so if I'm doing a bittering hop, Warrior's my go-to. And then you can do first wart hop, uh, makes it a little smoother. Does everybody know what that is? Yeah. So the lactic is just for the match efficiency? Or? The lactic acid? Yeah. It's just a pH, because yeah. it's, it's so high. Have you ever tried using phosphoric? The which? Phosphoric acid. Uh, yeah, I, I, I didn't notice a difference and then I bought lactic and it's just so big container that I don't yeah, think yeah. I'll ever get through it. Do you ever pay attention to your finishing pH of my beer? No, I've never measured a finishing pH for any beer. I, I don't know, I, I figure if I hit where I want to at the beginning it should end up somewhere. Has anybody done that? So you measure like different pH, like different pH, like finishing pHs. And no. Again, so if you see a West Coast IPA, your sulfates versus your chlorides. Big difference, right? This is your aroma, your bitterness, and everything else. So again, just paying attention to water for different things you're doing, as well as the ingredients. Up. Down. Sorry, so what would that one do with the sulfate being like? So sulfate is aroma and bitterness and I give it a bit more crisp kind of like. The chlorides is that like thick mouthfeel, juicy, everything else, right? Which you don't want in a West Coast IPA. It was called like the lower pH, like accentuates the bitterness better. Yeah. I, I mean, Honestly, I'm just giving my opinion of what I found work and what hasn't. Like that was a horrible yeast combination. Don't go over 156 for for uh, mashing. Like if you're doing New England, I go 152 to 156. Uh, if I'm doing West Coast, I stick at like 150 the whole time. It's just you go online. Like there's so many different ways to do things. It's like you can dry hop at any temperature. Cold dry hopping. It's supposed to give you more aroma. I tried that, it didn't work out well for me. Uh, I don't know if it picked up oxygen or something happened. I find that if I dry hop, I like to dry hop at about 70 Fahrenheit and hold it for 48 to 36 hours max and then crash it down. Right, but it, it's, it's really what you guys want to do and the best way to make a beer that you want to do is Start with something and then start playing around with it till you get to what you like, right? And then hopefully other people like it as well. But don't don't think that you have to do it one way or somebody's gonna tell you this way. There's there's so many different ways to make a beer, right? Right. Do you find if you're scraping through smaller batches, do they can you scale them with exact ratios or do you have to add more hops for larger batches? So what what I like to do is um, I like to do a lot of split bat, uh, split batches. Sorry, I work till 7 a.m., so I'm a little. <laughs> uh, I'll do like a 15-gallon batch size. So if, uh, 
I have a spike system, so it's 20 gallons, and I can really play around with it, so it's great. And then I'll split it into two or three different fermenters, and then I can dry hop it differently, and it just allows me to do uh, three beers at once, so maybe I'll split up the yeast, or I'll split up the hop combinations, or I'll keep the hop combination the same, except different amounts, right? So that's where I found if you do two ounces uh, per gallon, it, it's... It's not good compared to, to three. If you go four, it's it's a bit overkill, but uh, that's how I know. Like more hops, you actually do need more hops. Um, but do you like if you're doing? Like, is it just as three gallons per gallon? That's sort of like a nice sweet spot. So when you're doing two gallons, or you're doing ten gallons, like that ratio is is fine. It works still. Or? Yeah, I, I find <coughs> two point eight. To, to three is kind of like where I, I end up liking to go. Um, it, it's weird though, because you'll enter into one combina uh, competition, they'll be like, oh, you need to add more hops, and the other one, it'll be perfectly fine. So it's, it's tough, but like I like about 2.8 if you do overall, with most of it being at the dry hop whirlpool. It's a very, very small amount in the boil. If I do anything, it's five minutes, uh, and then a small, small bit. Uh, if I want a bittering addition. Do you find there's diminishing returns though with the hops? Yeah, yeah, but unfortunately it's like you still have to do it, right? You're, you know you're getting hosed <laughs> and you're not getting a good bang for your buck, but... Uh, like I can't tell the difference between like three and four per gallon. <laughs> I mean, when you get up to there, uh, it, it depends on the beer, but like if, if you're going like the big hop bombs that are commercial, they're up there. Like I've talked to them and their hop rates, it's per barrel, but it, you break it down and I was doing like three and a half ounces per gallon and I was below theirs. Like I talked to Cloudwater and uh, Lawson's and a, a few other ones and, and it's high. Like it's not a commercially viable beer. That's why it's not shipped around a lot. Uh, the, it's really, really expensive to make and that's why we pay a lot. Find a sweet spot for Whirlpool temperature. For like multiple or like... I played around with it and I just found it wasn't worth my while. I got like really eager and I'm like, you know what, I'm going to get it down to 160 and then I'm sitting there and I'm watching like four episodes of Breaking Bad before it gets there. And I'm just like, now I just like, I huck it in, right? Like flame out sort of thing? Or? <clears throat> yeah, like it'll drop to like 190 pretty quick, but then you notice it takes a while to get quite a bit lower. Yeah. So I, I, I just become impatient. I mean, if you wanted to make the world's greatest beer, I mean, you could probably do that. But then there's other issues with whirlpooling too long. So it's like, which, yeah. which do you do? Pico Battle. Everyone yeah. seems to have their sweet spot for temperature. Yeah. yeah, yeah, exactly. I mean, there's no right answer for any of these. Uh, which other recipe do you want to see? You've seen this one? Newest IPA. Newest IPA. <laughs> there's my <laughs> note. <laughs> Screw you guys. No dice. <laughs> <laughs> um, so again, my favorite hops are Amarillo, Citra, and Mosaic. I just find that the, the hop crop is very well maintained. Uh, I don't know if anyone's used Galaxy. It is phenomenal when it works, and it's like chewing a lawnmower blade when it doesn't. It's weird, you can't get it, so it's really hard for me to bank on it. And if you're going to spend like a hundred bucks in hops to make a beer and it's going to ruin it, I just, I'm too hesitant to use it. These hops, I find that, you know, for the last four or five years, they've been pretty good. And we're getting a lot of good hops as well in, in Ontario. Like, uh, my friend up at uh, Highland Hop Yard, like, they've got some great Chinook, Cascade, and, and stuff like that. And it, it's great to use those type of hops as well. It's always Ian. Ian's always a talker. But he's a Notre Dame. He's a Notre Dame fan, so I feel bad for him. But he, he loves Rudy. <laughs> so in terms of how uh, you use your hops, what's like the oldest you, you've used in an IPA? Is it like I imagine you freeze your hops? And then... Yeah. So I'll do vacuum sealing uh, and reusing them. I used to do the bulk buy a lot, but now I've kind of shied away from it. Just I'm not making enough IPAs and. Uh, I've just been buying them fresh, just again, you become paranoid with oxygen for a lot of these. And if, when I'm, like I've done probably 30, 40, 50 different IPAs. So now when I'm like trying to zone in, I don't want 
I don't want the reason the IPA didn't work because of the freshness of ingredients. So I'll actually like go out and get the fresh malt every time and the fresh hops. It costs me more, which sucks. But if I'm doing trial and error, because I was going to open a brewery and then we decided to have another kid. Love him to death. Not complaining. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, opening a brewery with two kids under two is like, you get it. Um, <laughs> So I normally just buy them each time. Like at, what, at what age do you find old is too old for you? I, I don't really look at the packaging. As long as it's like the, the, the way they package them, I think it's, it's quite well. I haven't had any issues with any of the bulk buy hops or like anything like that. Or yeah. yeah, I mean, what it comes down to is, is us. We're, we're where it breaks down, not, not the manufacturers. Uh, I've had the sealers like you seal it and it's great and then you throw it in and then you come back like a month later and it's like loose and you're like what the heck so i just don't trust it and i just don't want that to be the reason um so yeah like the carafoam the chit malt uh the pale ale and this is another one omega the tropical ip is great but you'll see there's certain continuity to it and you see ever mashes. So this one was mashed at 158. Okay, it's pretty high, trying to get the juiciness. I would go back to 156. And you guys still have beer, right? Please, please be drinking. <laughs> and then stop me whenever. Like, it's just if you guys have questions, you have questions. Oh, one other thing is make sure you keep notes. If you do a beer and it turns out great and you have no notes, then it's going to really suck because you're going to not remember how to do it well. So I'll break down the dry hops, where it's going, the ounces, and then just critiques like the malt bill's thin, you know, switch it up a bit more, do different things. Also keep track of when you're kegging it. Uh, and how you do it differently, right? Because you don't, when it comes to IPAs, uh, it's all post-fermentation is where you're gonna end up with a lot of your issues. Like your brew day will go fantastic and then it's the other stuff where you can go sideways. So keep track of, of all those things. And then if it's like something goes wrong, you can kind of go back to the last stage and go, okay, what happened here? <coughs> Mike, I think I saw you, you, it said salt as a mineral addition. Is that something you regularly do? It always puts it in, I never actually okay. do it. Um, <laughs> that is something people are doing now. They're, they're adding actual salt. Yeah. Which is I an interesting that one. Smoke, the sodium was high. Yeah. And the calcium wasn't too high, but it's because you got sodium chloride. Yeah. Yeah. Because it, he doesn't follow his recipe. <laughs> I know, I, I just contradicted my whole presentation. <laughs> No, I mean, if you, t if you go and you delete the salt, it actually doesn't change anything except for the sodium. So I don't know what's going on with Beersmith, why they kind of pre-populate it. But normally, like some recipes, I'll just go in and delete this one. I just kind of left it in, but I don't put salt in it. Any other questions? Let me just see if there's anything I forgot. <laughs> Going, going. All right. I mean, the best thing is, is just send me a message.